Maravet is an optometrist scientist and is active in clinical research related to individuals' adaptations to blindness. He is also an associate professor of ophthalmology at Harvard Medical School and a director at the Laboratory for Visual Neuroplasticity at Mass Eye and Ear. He's a friend of Perkins, and he's now a new friend of MCB. Please join me in welcoming our keynote, Dr. Lofty Maravet. Um, 
and uh, it, it's really a very challenging field, as you mentioned, or as you saw Rebel Carey yesterday, uh, but extremely rewarding. I'm very, very thankful that I have this opportunity. And the third piece is I have a background in public health. Uh, it was mentioned yesterday about the importance of advocacy, the importance of working in the community, and I completely agree. I think meetings like this are crucial. You know, you think of the advantages that were made in autism. <laughs> well, how did they do it? They brought parents, scientists, teachers, educators, genetic counselors, all these people together, and it was a massive upswell. It was a massive momentum that, that was able to be generated. And there was a time not too long ago when we thought autism was caused by mothers who neglected their kids. Right? We used to call them the refrigerator mom theory. You know, you couldn't have been more wrong, right? And look how they turned it around. Look the advantages they made. Why, why can't CBI have the same thing? Um, yesterday, Alan, you had mentioned that you, you felt a little bit embarrassed, you know, over the years of not knowing about CBI. I completely share that sentiment. And I'll tell you a little bit how I got into the CBI field. So um, I, uh, I used to go around you know, giving lectures about blindness and, and brain damage and things like this. And invariably, every time I gave a lecture, there'd be somebody in the back row who raised their hand and said, yeah, but what about CBI? And I would stand, you know, very confident and think about this, and I would say, what's CBI? I have no idea what you're talking about. So anytime I have any question or concern about CBI, I call Derek, right? <laughs> so after many lunches at Victor's across the street, it became very, very obvious just how big an issue this was. And again, as, as I mentioned, I felt, as a clinician, as a neuroscientist, embarrassed that I really didn't know how big a problem this was. Unfortunately, you know, again, because of thanks to the community and the ties that we have, we can disseminate this information. We can realize just what the magnitude of the challenge is. So I'm, again, very, very thankful for that. Um, I'll be very honest with you. I'm a complete novice and a newcomer to this field. I've been doing this for about maybe three, four years. And compared to my colleagues who spoke yesterday and later this afternoon, I, I think I'm the last person who should be talking to you about CBI, uh, let alone getting, uh, given the, uh, the keynote. But I, I will also say that I think being a newcomer has its advantages in the sense that I don't have any preconceived notions of what CBI is or isn't. And what we're going to show you, what the, the results from our group, is we use a very data-driven approach. We are just going to use brain imaging and look under the hood. We're going to see what the brains look like and kind of draw conclusions from there and see if this fits with the clinical aspects that you're all very familiar with. So the last thing I'll just say, a couple of housekeeping aspects. Um, uh, I tend to use, if those of you who have seen me uh, lecture before, I tend to use a lot of graphics and pictures of brains and things like that. Uh, for our friends who are visually impaired, if I tend to glance over a figure very, very quickly, as I tend to do, please just stop me. I'll be happy to kind of go into a little more detail, do my best impersonation of audio description. Uh, I want to be able to make sure all that information gets out. And then the second thing, just to say, um, you'll hear me very often say the blind and blind people and a blind person. I am indeed familiar with person-first language. Uh, I want to just be sure that you all realize that this isn't a sign of disrespect on my part if I'm not using it. Just when I'm in neuroscience mode, we, we tend to work that way. So I just want to make that disclaimer as well. So with that, on with the show. And uh, here is my first slide. We, oh, good start, all right. <laughs> Yesterday we talked about the critical period, the fact that the brain, there's a particular window, a particular time when the brain is particularly receptive to change. We call this the critical period. And this is indeed true, right? It's a lot easier to learn a language when you're six than when you're 60. But it doesn't mean it's impossible, right? So when we talk about brain function, we're going to talk about plasticity, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. We're talking about times and windows where the brain is particularly more receptive than others. And as neuroscientists particularly interested in plasticity and rehabilitation, our goal is to try to understand what are the parameters here, and can we open this? Can we make that critical period larger? What does it take to open that up? How is it possible to learn a skill much later in life or after brain damage and so on? Much the same way you would as a child, for example. So that is a big, big focus of, of the research that we do. And I also want to highlight that a lot of what we know about the brain, the visual system, and the critical period is really thanks to these two gentlemen. This is David Hubel and Torsten Lewis. David Hubel was a professor at Harvard, and unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. And they shared the Nobel Prize for essentially discovering the visual cortex. When I was a graduate student, this was gospel for us. We read all their papers. We did everything that they did. And this really revolutionized how we thought about how the brain worked in particular in terms of the visual system. One of their important experiments is they decided to work with kittens. They would rear kittens under various situations or conditions. 
they would close and attach one eye, and they would look at how the visual brain changed, or they would close the other eye, or they would, they would close both eyes, or they would close one eye very, very early on, and they would open the other eye to see in terms of timing effects and so on. So the reason why I'm telling you this is that today, the way we treat amblyopia is largely driven from the experiments that were done in basic science and anatomy and so on. So there is a fundamental relationship between how the brain works and how ultimately we take care of individuals with visual impairment. That's, that's what I was trying to say with this slide here. Now, of course, when I was going through school, I was, I was always taught that if you didn't treat amblyopia before the teenagers, you know, you had to do this in the younger ages, that's it. That person was never going to regain vision in that eye. And it turns out today that that's actually not true. We know that there is opportunity to regain vision even when a person is an adult and when it's treated. So that's why we tend to talk less about the critical period and more about the sensitive period, meaning that there is a window of opportunity that extends throughout a lifetime, but there are periods that are more amenable than others. And again, as I said, from a neuroscience perspective, our goal is to try to open this as much as possible and take advantage of this from a rehabilitation and education standpoint. So let me define the term neuroplasticity for you. Neuro, obviously, meaning the brain, and plasticity or comes from the Greek word plastikos, which means to mold or to shape. And the same way that a piece of plastic can be molded into a new form, into a new shape, so too can the brain. Right? So we'll go through this definition here. Neuroplasticity is the ability of the brain to change its structural and functional <coughs> organization in response to development, experience, the environment, or damage. The important thing to realize is that it's not always a positive thing. We have this idea that plasticity is this magic fix. And it's not really the case. There is such thing as maladaptive plasticity. And a good example of that is phantom limb pain. These are patients, for example, who have had an arm amputated, a, a, a leg, or a foot. And these individuals are in immense pain all the time. They'll tell you, these patients say, I feel like my hand is being crushed in the vice. And there's no hand. And that's because the brain is trying to figure out what to do with the fact that that limb is missing. Right? So sometimes plasticity can be good. Sometimes plasticity can be bad. The important thing to realize is that this is an inherent, intrinsic property of the brain. And the goal is to try to understand it. The limits, the constraints, what makes it good, what makes it bad. How can we open the potential of plasticity in a positive way from a rehabilitative and education standpoint? And of course, every neuroscientist has their favorite neuroplasticity story or, or, or brain imaging story. I'm going to share you one of mine. Uh, this one is called Tiny Brain, No Obstacle for French Civil Servants. <laughs> Oh well, wait, here's better. So, I'm showing you a picture here of an MRI brain. Which is, so this is an MRI scan of, the, of, a, of a normal brain. And just to orient you, I'm showing you the eye at the front here. And you can see this is all brain tissue here. And yes, the brain is supposed to be completely full and packed like this. This dark area here, this is gray matter. And then all this uh, tissue that you see inside is white matter. These are the connections between the brain and the brain. So one day, this gentleman in his 40s went to see his doctor. And he said, you know, I, I got these headaches. I'm not really feeling very, very well. Uh, Sure, you know, he was told, let's just go to the beach and just have some fun. <laughs> just have a nice meal, you'll be fine. You know, so after a while, <laughs> after a while, he comes back, he just starts hounding his doctor and says, okay, fine, you know what, I'm going to get an MRI. All right, let me take a look at your brain. And this is his brain. All right, so let me orient you here again. So this, again, I showed you on the left is a, is a normal brain. You see all the brain structures here. His brain is essentially this two centimeter lip around the, uh, the circumference of the skull here. And everything that I'm showing you here in black is basically water, right? That's cerebral spinal fluid. This guy had no idea this was his case. He was in his 40s, he got married, he had kids, you know, and had a job, and one day, you know, I got headaches, right? Had no clue. Um, it's perhaps not very flattering if you're trying to assume that you can get away with something like this, but it's just a great example of how the brain can adapt, right, under certain situations. And we have to understand what those circumstances are. How are these things? How do we leverage that into, into, our, into our advantage? I also want to talk to you about, yes, question. Just, just very quickly. Yes. Uh, are you telling me that that person functioned absolutely normally other than headaches? Correct. And had no idea that was their brain. They went through life, got a job, as I said, got married, had kids, and in his 40s decided to go see his doctor because he had some headaches, hounded his doctor, finally the doctor said, fine, we'll get an MRI, and that's what it looks like. He had no idea. Yeah. That's right. Uh, I know that's a good question. <laughs> that's a good question. But again, just to show you that you know, there's all sorts of quirks.
works in courts and all sorts of strange things that happen, and sometimes people just have no idea that this is actually going on. And there are many, many stories like this. I, mean, I, just, I just show you this one to kind of give you an extreme example of just how the brain can adapt itself. All right? I mean, if, you showed, if I showed you this picture and didn't tell you anything, you'd think this person is probably paralyzed and in a coma or something, right? It's not at all the case. Right? And I actually you know, have more to say about that in just a couple of minutes. So the last thing also I'll mention in terms of my introduction is what I call neuro myths. These are sort of statements about the brain functioning that seem, you know, that seem to be sort of uh, propagated at cocktail parties and various events and so on. I want to take just a, a second to talk about two that I think are, are important and relevant to our conversation today. So the first one is this idea that we only use 20% of our brain. And I've heard this in many versions, 25, 30, 40%. It seems to change every time I hear it. So my question to all of you is, who thinks this is actually true? Be honest. <laughs> the French guy. The French guy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to have to reorder my slides. <laughs> well, I, actually, no, I do have the answer to that. I do have the answer to that. So who thinks this is true? Right? You? Yeah. Maybe at, at this one time, one part of the brain is lit up, maybe 20%. But we're talking yeah. about what you guys are thinking. What you're saying here is that we're, there's potential, right? We're not really working on our maximum potential. And I think that's absolutely true. But the number itself just isn't at all possible. Because, and think of it this way, 20% is a, is, is a fraction. It's 20 over 100. In fact, that's what the percentage symbol is. It's 100, right? So to have 20, that means you need to know what 100 is, right? So what is 100%? Who is that person? What does that person look like? Right? This is a numerator without a denominator. It just doesn't make, doesn't make any sense. So the fact of the matter is, is you use all your brain all the time. And I always joke, it doesn't matter how smart you think you are, or who you voted for, or what your favorite baseball team is, it doesn't matter, or what you do. You use all your brain all the time. What makes you different from me, from the person sitting next to you, is how the brain's connected. So it seems that in the case of ocular blindness, Blind individuals are able to compensate for the loss of sight by enhanced non-visual skills. They seem to be able to localize sounds in space. They seem to be able to, have a, uh, be able to discriminate tactile uh, patterns, identify smells, and even have superior memory as well. But as I said, this is with certain caveats, and I'll mention them in just a second. What about structural changes in the brain? The old use it or lose it sort of, sort of mentality, right? If you don't use a certain muscle, it kind of atrophies and kind of wastes away. But what about your brain? If there's so much territory dedicated to vision, and you never develop vision, does that part of the brain just waste away? Do we have any evidence of whether that's the case? How do we study something like that? And then finally, what we call functional changes. What is the fate or the role of visual parts of the brain, and how does the brain rewire itself in the context of profound visual deprivation? Right? So we're talking about behavior, we're talking about structure, we're talking about function. And they're all so let's talk a little bit more about that. So as I mentioned, there is a lot of scientific evidence demonstrating that the blind do seem to have superior non-visual skills. But again, as I said, there are certain caveats. One of them is it doesn't appear to be a, a situation of improved sensory threshold. It doesn't mean that a blind person has superior you know, auditory acuity. It seems that what they're able to do is commit more attention to that modality. So if you take vision out of the equation, they are able to dedicate more attentional resources to that modality, attend to it more, and therefore use it in a more effective way. Um, the other thing to realize is that often these demonstrations are under very controlled, specific scientific environments. Right? So it's one thing if you can demonstrate in an anechoic chamber that a blind person can, can identify a sound better than a sighted person. It's very, very different if that person is trying to listen at a very busy intersection, for example. So how much of this actually translates to the real world isn't, isn't entirely um, the fact that we compare it to sighted people, right? This is often the story. Blind people are better than sighted people at this certain task. Well, is it really because blind people are better? Or just sighted people are really bad if you ask them to lift up their eyes open? Right? right? It's, two, it's, it's two sides, of, two heads of the same, or two sides of the same coin. Um, sensory versus cognitive function. Is it indeed the fact that blind people have better sensory function? Or is it just that they are better at taking that information and using it from a cognitive standpoint? Enhance memory. On. And the way that they manipulate that information only appears that they're better hearing or better or better touch or smell, but really what it is is it's cognitive function. And finally, 
Certainly there are many, many uh, contributing factors that we just don't know how they play in. You know, whether you're born blind versus early in life versus later in life, uh, whether it's sudden profound blindness, if it's no light perception versus some sort of shape or form. We don't know how these variables play into this. And that's an area of active research right now. So you notice I have a picture here of Andrea Bocelli, um, you know, in terms of coming in this country. And the reason why I chose this is because I had the pleasure of meeting him a couple of years ago. I was doing work for his foundation. And just to prove to you how big a nerd I am, when I was, uh, when I met him, when everybody else was asking for his autograph and had his picture taken with him and so on, I ran up to him and I said, Mr. Bocelli, do you hear better? Do you have a better memory? Do you think you have I just pepper him with all these questions. And, and he looked at me and he said, you know, I, I really don't think so. I've never been tested formally or anything like that. And then I asked him, I said, Mr. Bocelli, how did you succeed? How were you able to be the person that you are today? And he goes, it's very, very simple. I had an extremely supportive family. I had opportunities, and I was able to thrive and do the things that I wanted to do, and that's why I was successful. And this was not lost upon me in any way, because what it tells us is that even if we were able to understand all these brain issues with the moment, <coughs> at the end of the day, this is about opportunity. If we provide blind individuals or people with visual impairment with opportunities to thrive, they will thrive. And this really, really resonated with me. So going back to this idea from the brain standpoint, we want to have a better sense, as I said, the relationship between brain structure, function, and behavior. And in particular, this idea about how the remaining senses come into play in terms of uh, a function. So just to remind you, I'm going to show you this little cartoon here. The five senses are all processed in different parts of the brain. So the back of the brain, as you know, is visual, the occipital cortex, the parietal cortex in the front of the area there is responsible for touch. Um, there's the, the side of the brain here near the temporal cortex is responsible for hearing, which is great, not too far from the ear. Taste, smell, all processed in different parts of the brain. And of course, the miracle is, is if the five senses are processed in different parts of the brain, how do they all kind of come together and the world is so seamless? What's the answer? Connectivity, right? It's all about putting it together. It's all about how the brain is wired so that, oh, not me that one. <laughs> it's all about wiring. It's all about connectivity. So this is why I keep harping on this issue. is how your brain is wired that decides how things happen. Yeah? So when you're describing it this way, I've yeah. always had this question about this. Um, the wiring from the senses are going to those areas principally first, primarily, and then being distributed. Is that what that, that's what that means? I'm going to show you. We'll even get your brain scanned if you want. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. Do you have any headaches? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, this obviously begs the question from a neuroscience perspective. If this 30, 40% of your brain is dedicated to vision, and this we know, we've actually measured this, what does all of this do if you're born blind? Stay silent? Does it waste away? Does it atrophy like a muscle, for example? Or does it do something else? Can it do something else? And a lot of people from a neuroscience standpoint started looking at this very, very question. So the first thing we started thinking about, or one of the things we started talking about, I should say, is the structure of the brain. And very interestingly, if you look at the cortical thickness, if you look at how thick the brain is in the visual part of the brain, it turns out that it's thicker than it is inside of people. Now, what exactly does that mean? So it's certainly not what we thought. It's not that the visual cortex is shrinking or it's, or it's actually being wasting away. It's actually getting thicker. The problem is, is why is it getting thicker? Right? Well, to answer that question, you have to look at the function of the brain. Right? So that gives us a clue that something's going on. We now want to understand the function of the brain. So to do that, we use a technique called functional MRI or, or magnetic resonance imaging. You're probably all familiar with this. Very, very briefly, fMRI looks at brain activity or correlates brain activity with metabolic changes in the brain. So if a muscle, for example, works harder, it's going to command more oxygen, it's going to command more blood compared to the rest of the body. The brain is exactly the same thing. If a certain part of the brain is working harder than the rest of the brain, it's commanding more blood, it's commanding more oxygen, and that's a signal that the MRI scanner can pick up on. So what we ask somebody to do is lie in a scanner and do a certain task. Count backwards from, from 100. Think about their mother. Uh, uh, open and close their, their, their hand, look at pictures. And then we ask them to, quote, do nothing, rest. And then we 
you subtract the two, what's left over is, in theory, the part of the brain that's associated with the task that was being done. So anytime you see these sort of heat maps, these sort of activation maps, first of all, realize that this is a statistical phenomenon. This is not a direct recording of brain activity. This is a statistical phenomenon. And just because the rest of the brain isn't colored doesn't mean it's not active. It just means in relative terms, it's not as highly active as the rest of the mission. All right? So let's take a look at a piece of experiments where people looked at this in early blind individuals. So I'm showing you here a brain activation map. And if you look closely in the back of the brain, you see this highlight, this hot spot of activity in the occipital visual cortex. I'm going to, to prove to you I don't have neglect syndrome. <laughs> we'll get back to that. Um, and the question is, if this person is profoundly blind since birth, why would their visual cortex be active? And the answer is, this person is reading Braille. Right? So this was one of the very first demonstrations that the visual cortex does something else in the case of blindness. Right? And many people have replicated this, and many people have used it in other, other modalities, and we know that the visual cortex is also responsive to verbal memory, it's also responsive to smell, it's also responsive to sound localization. All the other sensory modalities that are intact seem to somehow drive the visual cortex. And the theory now is that the visual brain is the seat of compensatory behaviors <coughs> in the case of ocular blindness. Compensatory, okay. compensatory behaviors. The ability of, a, of an individual with ocular blindness to adapt to the loss of sight is fundamentally linked to what the visual brain becomes. All right, thanks a lot. You have to. <laughs> <laughs> What, what I'm talking about here, but certainly during the question period, I, I'll give you some thoughts about that. And I think that's a very, very important point because we talk, we know that Braille literacy is on the decline, and some people are arguing, well, you can, you can do it by books on tape and things like that. That certainly speaks to brain development, and certainly that has something to do with the deck. So I ask you to hold that question if you can. All right? Uh, other side. Yes? sense active there, right? So it actually does correspond to touch as well. So the touch area certainly is active, right? But it's the fact that that braille reading task also drives the visual brain as well. Good point. Okay? So let's talk a little bit more about this phenomenon. Because I know what you're saying to me. You're saying, oh, man, you're just playing with Photoshop and you know your fancy stuff in your office. <laughs> let, me, let me prove to you or give you a piece of evidence that what's going on here from a compensatory standpoint is indeed actually true. So this is a patient that I had the chance to work with many years ago, and this is a story that happened before I actually arrived at the lab. So I'm telling the story the way that I was told. So this is a woman at the time who's 63 years old. She's a right-handed female. She's blind since birth, generally blind to the retinopathy of prematurity. Her reported visual acuity was no light perception in both eyes, which is a little dramatic, I would think, for ROP, but we'll, we'll let them have that. She uh, had normal milestones. She learned to read Braille at the age of six, and she was a highly proficient Braille reader. I can tell you, as I'm sure all of you know, 120 to 150 symbols per minute is a very, very fast Braille read time. She worked as an editor for a Spanish magazine back in Spain. Um, she was very proficient with Braille, was very, very good with Braille. There's really, really no question there. One day, she wakes up and ta-da, has a headache, all right? So she says, you know what, I'm not going to go to the doctor. I'm going to go to work. And she said, I feel fine. Sure enough, the headaches get worse. She feels really, really lightheaded. She has difficulty swallowing. And finally, she passes out. She loses consciousness. She's rushed to the hospital. She slips into a coma for 24 hours, comes through, and the doctors tell her, you're fine. You, you were in a coma. You woke up. You know, woke up. <laughs> <laughs> now, maybe this was France. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, they said, you're fine, don't worry about it, everything's okay, the headaches will go away, yeah, no problem. So she wakes up in 24 hours, she's alert and interactive, she's okay, yeah, okay, no problem. And she said, can I have my phone book, please? I, I want to be able to, to contact uh, my family. And she takes her phone book, which is written in Braille, obviously, and she starts reading the book, and she says, you know, this is really, really strange. I, I know this is Braille, I can feel the dots, but I have no idea what this says. I can't read anything. What happened? She has 
That's true. Where? Where? In the visual cortex. Not the language part, not the part responsible for hearing, not the part responsible for touch, the part of the brain theoretically she would have use for. Okay? So what I'm showing you here is a T2-weighted MRI scan. What you see in the back of the brain here, this white area here is dead and part of the tissue. We think she had an embolism of the tip of the basilar artery, blew out both things, flexed the lobe. And to this day, she's alexic, acquired an ability to read because of her occipital stroke. So pretty dramatic and pervasive example, but showing you that what's going on in the visual brain matters to these people. And there's other evidence I won't get into for an interest of time about using brain stimulation and so on. But what's happening to convince you that the visual brain is indeed important? This isn't, this isn't a phenomenon that's just sort of tied in or it's me playing with Photoshop. This is actually legitimate going on. You may ask the question, well, what about if I was born blind versus I lose my sight later in life? That's an important question. So this guy, Harold Burton, did this study, did a, uh, did a brain imaging study, and he compared early blind patients or individuals compared to late blind individuals, so people who lost their sight before the age of three, versus individuals who lost their sight later on as adults in their 20s or 30s, who were matched for Braille reading skill. And that's crucial. Both groups were reading Braille at the same level. And what he found in that situation is that the early blind individuals had activation of their visual cortex, whereas late blind individuals also had activation of their visual cortex, but to a lesser degree. So again, fitting with the sensitive period and critical period, change can happen, but it appears to decrease as time goes on. That doesn't mean you can't make it to the same level, but pound for pound, these changes seem to be correlated with the onset. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry? Does the physiology of the way the onset forms matter? Great question. Uh, and that's a, that's a factor that, that, that hasn't been teased out, unfortunately. I'm sorry. Excuse me. So the question is, does the etiology of the blindness matter? Like, for example, if it was ROP versus, say, trauma or something along those lines, does that, does that play in? As far as we can tell, that doesn't seem to matter. It doesn't mean that it doesn't. But there's no evidence to date that the etiology of the blindness seems to somehow affect whether or not the visual brain is improved or decreased. That's a good question. Okay. Uh, sorry, question in the back. I'm sorry. Um, yes, I, I find this whole topic really pretty fascinating. And okay. I guess my question is related to what you were talking about um, with regard to reading. Yes. If, if, if a totally blind child is reading a real book, yeah. say the secret garden on uh, Harry Potter, right? uh -huh. and a sighted person, a sighted child is, and the sighted child conjures up an image of a yeah. garden. I really believe that that representation exists somehow. Another, I'll give you another example. Uh, I asked this condemned blind person about colors. I was involved, I kind of, some of you know this, I was involved with a documentary film. It's called Do You Dream in Color? that studied how condemned blind children dream and what was the content of their dream and how it relates to their lives. Uh, and one of the individual asked me, what's the color gray to you? And she said, the gray, color gray is kind of like the smell of pavement after it rains. It's interesting. And right away, I had an image where I made a pavement. So, so just to repeat, I get to paraphrase. So uh, the comment was, uh, as a congenitally blind person, I sort of have these images in my mind about color as well. You know, blue is kind of this cool sensation. Uh, green is kind of like a moldy type uh, type sensation as well. And that certainly makes sense. So one common question I can ask you right now is why, in some cases, colors are associated with smells. 
And the other example was, you know, uh, related to temperature. Why would that be the case? Connectivity. There it is again. It's how you associate the brain.
right? These kids weren't surviving 20, 30, 40 years ago, and they are today. And they're surviving, they're living longer, and they're living with complications, right? So that's something that was said already yesterday. Here's a couple of other things that kind of worry me, if you will, or some, some other comments. If you look down the list, right, in the case, for example, the 2012 study, look at the things that you see there. Things like ROP, remnant of prematurity, cataracts. Those are all things that we can take care of, unfortunately, we figured out. So that theoretically is going to continue to decrease. At the very bottom, you're seeing things like infection, rubella, herpes, things like that. And also, from a public health standpoint, we should be able to get a good handle on with time as well. And in the, sort of the middle area, you see all these congenital uh, issues, levers, retina, excuse me, uh, retinitis pigmentosa. These are all things, in theory, with advancements in gene therapy, all these exciting areas that we're seeing, theoretically, that should be decreasing as well. So over time, this gap is going to increase if things go the way that they should be trending. Just one second. So what that means, in my mind, is that you know, 30, 40, 50 years from now, what you and I will understand as blindness and visual impairment is going to take on a completely different meaning. And I can tell you that the comment earlier, I think it was Garinda who said, said that eye doctors are clueless in that. I completely agree. We're, we didn't go to school for this. We didn't prepare for this. It certainly wasn't the way that we were taught. So there is definitely a trend coming that we need to worry about. Question. Uh, yeah, we yeah. were talking about this a little bit this morning before the lecture started. And is it possible that this hasn't been diagnosed in earlier generations? Uh, I think Meg was going to have Absolutely. to talk about that. I mean, yeah. is this one track? Absolutely. That, that's true. And, and that's the problem with all epidemiology and all questionnaires in general. You know, the questionnaire is only as good as the questions that you ask. Right? Mm -hmm. If you don't ask, you're not going to get that information. And there's no doubt in my mind that it's underdiagnosed as well. I'll mention very briefly as well, we'll get to this in the next slide. Uh, very, very often in these situations, these kids have cerebral palsy, right? What's the bigger issue? It's the motor, right? I can tell you from my own personal experience, I have a cousin who's very, very close to me who has CP. I've talked to his parents. He has one eye. He's strabismic in one eye. And I asked his, you know, his folks, what's the deal? You know, what's going on? He goes, oh, I can't have an eye at one point. But the doctor said that's going to fix it. We're worried about him walking. We're worried about him getting out of bed. Right? So getting to your point about underdiagnosis, I think every kid with a diagnosis of cerebral palsy needs to be worked out for a visual issue. Absolutely. Yeah, no question. OK? A couple of quick comments, again, for the benefit of those people who were here uh, yesterday, or also the drive home points that were made yesterday. The major causes of CVI, things like head injury, trauma, infection, uh, encephalitis meningitis. But the big, big driver in terms of the population that we have been working with is some sort of perinatal hypoxic or ischemic event. Essentially, the fetus has a stroke in the mom's belly. That's what's going on. There's massive hemorrhaging, there's bleeding, tissue dies, tissue doesn't develop. What, what's going on here? So I'll just show you this figure here to kind of walk you through it. You notice that in the fetus, this ventricle, remember the part of the brain that I told you that normally is filled with water, with cerebral spinal fluid? There's a bleed. It fills with blood, right? There's a massive hemorrhage that pours into the ventricle. As the brain continues to develop over time, that blood is absorbed, right, slowly. But unfortunately, around the brain, there's damage caused. I'll get back to that in just a second. Just to orient you a little bit more on this slide, the top part is the gray matter, right? And the white part here is the white matter. These are the cables, right? So the sort of the analogy to think about on this figure here is think about your desktop computer, right? The gray matter is kind of like the desktop. That's the business end. That's where you're interacting, doing all the calculations. If you look under the desk like this, and we see all the horrible cables dangling around in there, that's actually the white matter. Right? So that's kind of how we think about gray matter and white matter, just one second. Um, so that is the, inter, the interrelationship uh, between the two. Yeah? The, in, in fact, the, the, the insults to the brain have to happen during that sensitive period? So, well, it's actually during development, before full percent of the period. Okay. It's actually happening in the airway natally. Okay. Yeah. Now, there are some people who think they're, who try to differentiate pre versus post, and I'm saying more generally around the growth period. Mm -hmm. All right. So some subtleties in this, and we, we can talk a little bit more about this, but I'm talking in a more general fashion, happening the developing fetus just before or around the period that the baby is born. Right? Now remember, these, born, these babies are born premature, early. Right? So a couple of other comments that I'll, that I'll mention here. Here's something that I think is very, very important in terms of the functional diagnosis or the operating diagnosis of CDI. CDI is suspected by, quote, a normal eye examination. That's not entirely true. I think in reality what we're trying to say here is that the ocular findings do not correspond to the visual impairment, yeah. right? That's the big issue. You can't explain what's wrong with this individual by looking at the eye, right? As far
far as I know, there isn't a single ocular condition that causes neglect. Right? I'd love to be able to see that. It doesn't happen. Yet. This is happening here. It's not happening anywhere else. So there's a mismatch between what the patient is going through and their deficits and their problems and what you see in terms of the structure of the health of the eye. Um, character, yeah. Question? So the question is, what causes the stroke? And the reality is, I don't know. There's something that's going on during the development of that fetus where the stroke happens. And the thought is, is that it could very well be a hypoxic event. Some sort, it could be the umbilical cord, for example, that, that is squeezed. Something that is going on that prevents the proper oxygen going to the brain. And the brain responds by this massive hemorrhage, bleeding through, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Right, Again. And, and the thought is, when you get into the nitty, the nitty gritty, all these details, and again, this isn't just one way that, that CVI can happen, it just seems to be a very, very common cause. Uh, yesterday, there was this, con this conversation, a question about PVL. There's a characteristic neurological finding in these kids with CVI, and that is peri ventricular leukomalacia. So let's go through word by word. Peri meaning peripheral, around, right? Ventricular meaning around the ventricles, right? Leuko, Greek word meaning white, because it's a white matter damage. Malacia, meaning softening. Right? Now, it doesn't mean somebody opened their brain and stuck their finger and said, let's talk to your heart. I've actually done that, by the way. It's false. <laughs> <laughs> what it means is that when you look at this in characteristic MRI findings, you look at this part of the brain, it's kind of fluffy. It kind of has this soft appearance because those white matter tissues are damaged. Right? It has a soft kind of look to it. That's what PDL is. Or, 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 the, re the meaning of the word, or, or the, the term, I should say, PDL. Very often, as I mentioned, there is an associated neurological complex. And very, very often it's the usual follow-up. If the bleed is massive, if the bleed tends to be a little bit more anterior in the ventricle, it's going to knock out the part of the brain responsible for movement, for animal tracks, right? Those kids manifest with CP. And that tends to be the bigger, bigger driver, and the visual aspect seems to be secondary. If it's more posterior, more focal, affecting just the visual parts of the brain, then we have some flat-out CVI. Uh, presence of unique visual, behavioral dysfunctions, things like visual, uh, visual spatial processing, visual and crowding, visual tension, as was mentioned yesterday as well. Big, fancy, complicated terms to tell you that something's going on with the brain. This isn't the eye. Complicated visual dysfunctions that need to be somehow explained. Um, the C in CVI, this is a conversation we had yesterday as well. This is not any hard and fast rule. This is a product of the way how I think about things in my, in my conversations with my colleagues here at, uh, at Perkins. When we talk about cortical visual impairment, when C means cortical visual impairment, I think of that of damage to early visual areas and or the optic radiations. So from the thalamus to the entry point of the visual brain. Right? Typically, these kids are going to have poor visual acuity or profound visual loss, and also at the same time, uh, the possibility of visual field deficit. Why? Because you're, you're damaging the visual brain early on. Right? Cerebral visual impairment is essentially damaged anywhere in the visual system at the cortical level. Right, through the temporal, through the frontal, parietal. This is damage to higher order visual areas, typically normal to moderate visual acuity function, and they have these higher order perceptual deficits. Right? So that's just a kind of a functional way of separating the two, two areas. It's important to realize that these two are not mutually exclusive. Right? In fact, maybe the real term should be CCVI, right? when you think about it. It's it even better. If you want to make the debate of congenital versus adult, then it's CCCVI. Right? If there's ocular complications and there's no reason to think why you know, eyes wouldn't have problems itself, then it's CCCVIIWOC. <laughs> I'm saying I'm being facetious here, but what I'm trying to say is that there's a limit to parcelating and labeling. I think that there is a time when trying to compartmentalize things certainly has benefits, but at the same time, we can't be dwelling on all these titles as well. At the end of the day, we need to be taking care of these kids. So I think we need to have these intelligent conversations amongst clinicians, scientists, educators, providers, everybody think what works for all of us that we speak the common language. I think that's one of the very, very first steps we need to do with, uh, with CVI. So Derek gave us a great presentation yesterday about the visual system. Again, for the benefit of those who weren't here yesterday, just sort of a quick review. Um, I'll tell you just sort of uh, some highlights of things to think about. Great quote from Aristotle. To see is to know what is where by looking. Well, this guy was a genius. He knew exactly what he was talking about. What, where, look, moving your eyes. That's vision in a nutshell, right, right there. Wish he was alive. I, I talked to him about CBI for sure. 
So things, as I said, start off at the level of the eye. Image is captured, it's captured to the back of the retina. Once it is compressed, we take a big, big image, we take essentially photographic film of that image, we compress that information, and we send it through the optic nerve, and it goes straight into the thalamus. It's called the lateral geniculum nucleus. This is the first relay station of information, where that information is compressed. From there, once you're into the thalamus, there are these massive optic radiations that send the information into the brain. And not to not the brain, the cortical areas of the brain, what's called the primary visual cortex. Right? So this is the entry point into the cortical areas of the brain. It's important to realize that how the world is mapped. Left is right, up is down, and vice versa. Why? I don't know, but that just turns out that's how the anatomy works, and that's going to be important in a couple of slides at least. Once you're in the primary visual cortex, we're now looking at the cortical visual it's important to realize that different aspects of the visual scene are again processed by different parts of the brain. So the color of that object, the motion of that object, the form of that object, the face uh, aspect of that vision are all processed in different parts. So the information is packaged, compressed, we enter the cortex, and we break it down and we reanalyze it. Right? How is it possible to look at something and make it all come together? Connectivity. Right? Again, there's that term again. That's how it all kind of comes so what the visual brain does, like all aspects of perception, is we take that information, we deconstruct it, we analyze it in its parts, and we put it back together again. Right? That's how the brain does this. It's also useful to think about this from a division of labor standpoint. Again, was mentioned yesterday. The dorsal stream, so connections from the primary visual cortex to the parietal cortex, this is involved with spatial processing. Things like movement, where an object is in space, spatial relationships. Connections that we know from the primary visual cortex to the temporal cortex, we know this as the what pathway. This is object processing. The color, the texture, the shape, the size, the, the faces, for example, the details, the fine details of objects. There is a third pathway that most people don't talk about. It turns out that there are direct connections from the primary visual cortex to the frontal cortex as well. This pathway is generally responsible for attention and moving the eyes. So there's actually three main and I'll make just a couple of quick comments as well. This is a great way to kind of compartmentalize it, to think about the visual system. But I promise you it's actually a massive oversimplification, and I'll give you a couple of thoughts about that as well. So one thing I want to mention is how do we even know this is true, right? How do we know that there's a where pathway and a what pathway? But how did this all come up? It's actually been known for quite some time in neurology and neuroscience, and it comes from studying patients who have selected damage to these areas. So patients, for example, who have damage to the parietal cortex, where pathway have a hallmark condition called neglect, you're probably all familiar with, particularly if they have damage to the right parietal cortex. These are patients who essentially ignore half their visual world. They're not blind in that visual field, they just simply don't think it exists. So if you ask them, for example, to draw a clock, they'll only draw one side, or they'll shave only half their face, or they'll eat only half the food on the plate. Right? There's all sorts of interesting experiments with this. this I, just, I was talking about it to someone yesterday, uh, about this, I saw a neglect patient on Wednesday. It's really a fascinating condition. It's really incredible. Um, there's a fascinating experiment, I'll tell you just very briefly, by a guy named Eduardo Dubiac, who's basically the guy who first characterized this in Italy. He's a neurologist in Milan. And if you've ever been to the city of Milan, you know that there's a large plaza in the middle of the city. There's this big cathedral, this gorgeous cathedral, a big square, and there are shops on the left and the right. And at the front, there's this big statue of Vittorio Emanuele, the former king of, of Italy. And every Milanese, knows this place like the back of their hand. Right? It's just the center of the city, everybody knows it. So Eduardo Viziak had all these patients who had this right parietal lobe damage. He had a very clever experiment. He said, you know what? I want you all to imagine that you're standing at the statue and you're looking at the cathedral. What do you see in your mind? So he said, well, these patients said, well, I see the cathedral. And he started listing all the stores that were on the right side. And he didn't say anything about the stores on the left side. He then asked the patients to announce Cross with the X. I want you to cross the square. I want you to stand at the cathedral and look at the statue. So basically what he did is he mentally rotated this in your mind. Now tell me what you see. And sure enough, he said, I see the statue. Then he started listing the stores on the other side and completely ignored the stores that they said just two seconds ago. Right? Which means that it's not even their actual perception that's impaired. Even their mental model of the world around them is actually have that impaired. Okay? So that's what happens with parietal the contrary situation, or the, the double dissociation situation, is when we have damage to temporal cortex, and we call these agnosias. Nosia means to know, <coughs> agnosia is to not know, right? 
These are people who can't identify common objects. Right? So for example, you take a patient with agnosia or object agnosia, and you give them a comb, and you say, what is this? They'll look at it and say, I don't know, I've never really seen this before. I have no idea what this is. So interesting. What, what would you do with this? And they'll take the comb, and they'll start combing their hair. Right? Why? Because the spatial aspect's intact. They know what it's for. They know what it's to do with it. They just can't tell you what it is. That's the dissociation. And the last part is what I'll mention is with the frontal cortex here. Again, the frontal part, this is the, the executive end. This is the business end. This is how we handle information. Great uh, classic experiment by a guy named Jarvis who basically built the first eye tracker. And the, what I'm showing you here is a picture of a scene of this, of this, animal, of this gentleman entering a room with a family. And he tracks the eye movements of individuals as they're looking at this picture. And he says here, in this, in this slide here, or this picture here, I'm showing you the free eye movements of the individual. And then he asks, OK, how old are the people Notice how the eye movements all of a sudden start focusing on their faces and how tall they are. Right? Same picture. Picture never changed. But how you move your eyes influences the information that you take in. All of this has to work together. There was a question yesterday about crosstalk. Right? How do these systems interact with one another? Absolutely. There is massive connections and connectivity between these areas. Right? So that's the first thing to think about. The other thing is that these are not dead ends. It's not parietal uh, visual cortex or viral cortex and that's it. The connections actually continue into frontal cortex, similarly from temporal. All of this is converging, yes, Vincent? All of this is converging into a massive system that's constantly exchanging information and analyzing information. So it's an oversimplification, but a useful way to kind of think about it. In fact, the real way to kind of think about how the visual brain looks like kind of looks more like this, to be honest with you. And this, again, is a simplification. Keep it oriented. There's V1 that was kind of lost right there, and everything else that has this is kind of a better representation, in my mind, of how the visual system is. Uh, question? Sure. Well, if someone has Alzheimer's, is that what happens? That object part of the brain starts to lose blood supply? Uh, Alzheimer's is a very, very specific situation. It's, Alzheimer's is, is typically um, uh, associated with, with a deposition of a protein called beta amyloid. Um, why that happens, there's a certain genetic predisposition that does this, and it creates what are called neurofiber, neurofiber fibrillary tangles. So the neurons and the brain cells end up becoming tangled, clockwise, if you will. Interestingly enough, they tend to be in areas of the brain involved with memory, the temporal cortex, the hippocampus, that is. And that's why the first telltale signs tend to be related to memory. But as the, as, as the disease progresses, as more and more damage occurs in the brain, more of this stuff will take place. So the consequences happen as well. All right? So a little bit more realistic picture in my mind of how the visual system works. Let's talk a little bit also about some previous models. This is Gordon Dunn. Uh, Derek also showed us this yesterday. Uh, one of his models where he calls this the tree of vision, where the left eye and the right eye and all kind of goes up in different aspects. I'll be very honest with you, I'm not actually a big fan of this particular figure. And the reason why is because that's really not how the visual system works. It's not a linear system from the eyes to the brain and that's it. It's a, it's a system that is constantly cycling. It's sending information back to the thalamus, back into the same time as information coming in from the eyes. So what the brain is doing is comparing what it sees with the model it has in its mind and trying to make sense between the two. So to give you an example of that, uh, this is a sort of famous illusion. You've probably seen this. It's, you can see either two faces or a vase, right? But you notice you can't see both at the same time? It's called a bistable illusion, right? Why? Because the brain is trying to make a decision. What's the figure and what's the ground? And it can't be both. Notice that as far as the retina is concerned, it's the same image, right? So it's the brain doing the work, not the eyes. Right? Other figure that's sort of quite common, and Gordon Dutton has, uh, has published many, many times, I think it's a good one, uh, showing you again this idea of dorsal and ventral stream um, connectivity and activation. The dorsal stream again going through parietal cortex, terminating in the frontal cortex, the ventral stream, the left pathway, and the temporal cortex. And of course, as I mentioned, this third pathway, this direct pathway from occipital cortex to the front part of the brain. There's an interesting idea that there seems to be sort of a uh, a predilection, if you will, for damage to the dorsal stream, what, the, what Gordon Dunn has called dorsal stream dysfunction. So there's a certain logic as to why this might be true in CVI, but it hasn't been something that's been really conclusively demonstrated from an anatomical standpoint. The other aspect is if you only ask spatial questions, so spatial related questions, yes, yeah, sure, you will definitely see a deficit. You have to ask evenly the other aspects of the objects as well. And if the child has never seen those objects, is going to have the acuity or is, uh, is verbal, can't even tell you. Really, really hard to assess that. So this idea of dorsal stream dysfunction.
function, I think, has anatomical sense. I think it's important that we, we demonstrate this. Just one second. How, how are we doing for time? You're good. Just because I, I just want to make sure I just keep going and we hold the questions. What, what's your thought? Another 10 minutes. Another 10 minutes? If it's possible, I really want to just get through the data and then kind of open up the questions. Is that all right for everybody? I don't want to offend anyone. It's just I really want to get to the, spend the time on the actual results of CDI since that's why we're here. Um, and then we can open up the questions afterwards. Is that all right with everybody? All right, otherwise, the hook is, uh, <laughs> okay. So here's, here's our measure. This is what we're going to try to do in this particular project. We believe that there is a relationship between the clinical findings, the visual dysfunctions of an individual, their structural brain properties and their functional brain properties. And we're going to use brain imaging to try to figure this system out. And I'll give you some, some evidence that, that this is indeed seem to be the case. As I mentioned, we do brain imaging with adolescents with CDI. And the reason why we choose adolescents in their late teens or the young, young adults is they have to lie still in the scan, one. And second of all, they have to tell us what their deficits are. So we have to interact with them. And that's not to mean that we shouldn't work with all kids with CDI. We do want to. But in the early phases, you have this sort of selective component of CDI because we need to work with them from, from a logistic standpoint. Great picture here uh, to show you. We spend a lot of time, invest a lot of time training these kids so that they're comfortable in the scanning environment. At the BU Center, we have a mock scanner that looks exactly the same as a real scanner, so it doesn't have an active magnet. So the kids can come in, we can explore, get the plot in, we can come back in. It's very they want, completely safe. We encourage them to bring their friends, their favorite stuffed animals. We scan them too. That's all right. So that they're completely comfortable. And you can see this uh, particular individual here is with their mother. Mother's there holding her hands the whole time, coaching them, making sure they're comfortable. So we do a lot of uh, research and background to figure out what the kids like and don't like, what are the trigger features to make sure they're comfortable. Turns out this particular individual loves e e uh, mummies and, and uh, Egypt, stories about Egypt. So we had this idea to wrap her up in a blanket. I said, OK, we're going to put you in the sarcophagus now. <laughs> She didn't move. What did she move? Right? On her motion correction? Yeah. And she, yeah, it turns out she's also a big fan of Scooby Doo, so we had that playing in the background. And then, yeah, she didn't move. Even more stable than our, than our control subject. So we do a lot of prep, we have a lot of understanding of what it means to make this kid comfortable so that we can collect the data. The other option is to anesthetize them. And we don't want to do that from a risk standpoint, but also at the same time, it's kind of hard to ask them to do things if they're asleep. Yeah. So that's why we spend this from, uh, from that side. So two cases that I'm going to present to you from the CDI standpoint. Case report one. At the time, this was a 16-year-old female. She was diagnosed with PVL, as I mentioned, born premature. She had a grade three hemorrhage, so she bled into her ventricles, as I mentioned, uh, with, uh, with hydrocephalus in terms of, so in other words, the, the brain expanded in size because of the fluid that was retained inside the brain. Her clinical uh, visual functional assessment revealed a smell and visual acuity of 20-40, both eyes open, that's pretty good. Uh, markedly reduced contrast sensitivity and a complete inferior visual field deficit. She had difficulties with eye tracking, fixation, visual crowding, object identification, and finding her way in complex environments was also reported. Can't explain that with 2040 vision, can you? A lot more going on. Case report two. This incidentally corresponds to patient M that Dr. Cran presented yesterday. We had a chance to actually scan that individual. This is the, the gentleman who has problems with cane ambulating, mm -hmm. patient mobility. At this time, the gentleman was 22 years old, diagnosed with PVL, born premature. Clinical visual functional assessment revealed a smell and visual acuity of 2080, so they considered it worse. Markedly reduced contrast sensitivity, as well as an inferior and peripheral visual field loss, particularly on the right side. Difficulties with depth perception, tracking, visual attention, crowding, visual fatigue were also reported. Again, a complex constellation of visual dysfunction that can't just be fixed with glasses. A lot more to this than that. Let me show you their structural MRIs when we decide to scan. And the, the A, I'm showing you um, an axial scan of the brain. This is a normal sighted control whose age match. Okay, so the same individual at the same age. On B, on the right, I'm showing you a brain from an individual who's ocularly blind. Looks pretty same, right? Pretty similar. Hard to tell, hard pressed to tell me who's blind and who isn't, right? Here are the brains of the two CDI subjects. And the first thing you should notice is this enlarged ventricle area here, compared to these two here. This is PVL, right? This enlarged ventricle is the hallmark sign of so that certainly can be helpful in one regard, but the problem is that it doesn't tell you anything more than that. There's no association with PVL and the large ventricles and the visual dysfunction. So in other words, standard clinical neuroimaging is not going to give you the answers. 
you have to be able to look at this in a way in more detail. Right? And this is how we're going to do it. And before I'm going to show you the technique, we're going to play a little game here. This is called the Neural Radiology Paradox. Remember the Sesame Street, the Sesame Street game, one of these brains and so on? I've got four brains, right? They all have different degrees of structural changes. Here, some have bigger ventricles versus others. I'm going to ask you which one you think has the best vision and which one has the worst vision, right? So your logic probably fits something like this, right? Well, two people playing. You might say something like this. Okay, why are we doing that? Two. You might say, okay, number three and number one seem to have kind of the worst ventricles. That's probably the worst. Number four, that person seems to be completely intact. That's probably the best vision. Number two, somewhere intermediate. That's probably the second best vision. And again, toss up between three and one. Does that kind of make sense to people? Right? Here are the answers. Turns out that number three had the best vision, 2020. Number one is the, was the intermediate. And number two who had the least potent PVL uh, in terms of ventricular size, had the worst vision. Number four is actually in a coma. Right? They just couldn't get their visual fluid to move up. Just to show you that, again, it's very, very hard to determine the patient's visual status just based on a standard structural MRI. So the neurological paradox the neuroradiological paradox is lesion load, the extent of apparent damage, does not always correlate with clinical symptoms. So that's what makes this job so tough. Right? This is the hard part. I see this from my clinical experience all the time. Sometimes I'm getting ready for clinic, I look at the MRI scan, and that looks good, everything's all done, the patient isn't responsive. Other times I look at it, hemorrhages in every corner of the brain, and they're sitting up waiting to talk to me. Right? This is the big, big challenge in, in this arena. It's very, very hard to tie the two things. So here is my big uh, thesis. CVI is a disordered brain connectivity. I've been driving this point home a couple of times. And underlying brain connectivity reflects observed visual dysfunction. I'm going to try to demonstrate why I think this is true. So yeah, certainly, CVI is a disorder of brain connectivity. Right? And the underlying connectivity reflects observed visual dysfunction. In other words, the changes in connectivity tells us something about what's wrong. How do we figure out how the brains are wired, right? Standard MRI is not going to be able to tell you. So we use a technique called diffusion-based imaging. I'm going to show you this quick video here. Essentially what we're doing here in the interest of time is we are tracking the movement of water molecules in the brain. And if a water molecule is moving along a certain axis, that is correlated or associated with the direction of the brain stem, right? What the software is doing is taking all that information all the white matter pathways of that individual. So the video that I showed you there was essentially your, your wiring, all the cables of the brain inside, right, based on just tracking the water movement. So I know exactly how the brain is wired. The other nice thing about this is we can do something called virtual dissection. We don't have to look at all the brain. We can pick things and structures that relate to the brain, like the optic radiation, like various strings, right? So let me show you exactly how this works. This is a site of control. Again, this is a three-dimensional rotation of this individual. You can see the brain is rotating here. These are all the white matter tracks of this individual overlaid in terms of their, uh, their, uh, their structural MRI. Now, on the next pass here, we ask the software, tell us all the connections of the visual brain, right? And here, it's going to strip those away. So these are all the connections of the visual brain to the rest of the brain, okay? So why is that useful, right? There's three main pathways that we're actually interested in. So here the software has identified the three main tracks. The SLF, which is from the occipital cortex, the parietal cortex, to the frontal cortex. The ILF, which is in the inferior line of cumulus, is going down to the temporal cortex. And this direct connection from the occipital cortex directly to the frontal cortex. Does this look familiar to anybody? It's the three pathways. It's the dorsal, ventral, and direct connection. So we now have the anatomical correlate of the three visual question now becomes, if we da if there's damage to these pathways, is this somehow related to them? Anybody want to see what it looks like in CVI individual? Yeah. Absolutely. There it is. That's a CVI individual. That's CVI1. So right away, what do you notice? First of all, there's fewer connections, right? You're virtually missing the direct connections from our occipital cortex to the frontal cortex. And what were her visual deficits? Attention. She didn't seem to have much problems with objects, but visual work was also a big problem as well. We have an anatomical correlate. So, showing you again, uh, the other sort of interesting piece of this, and notice here in the side of control, as I showed you, those are the three main pathways. I'm showing you here the left hemisphere only. 
Notice the operative line situation looks very much the same. Right? For an operative line person, all the connections are there. Right? In our two CVIs, right, a lot of stuff missing. Again, CVI Q is the patient that you saw yesterday with the Andrew Phillips colony as well. It's clearly missing connections. Right? We can look at this from a whole brain standpoint as well. All the connections inside. Here are the connections in a normal sided control. You're looking at this like a bird's eye view of all the connections. See all those dense connections on the side there? That's our cyclical temporal, our cyclical parietal. Here's what it looks like from a network standpoint in an ocular blind. More connections, right? It's a hyper-connected brain. Maybe this is why they're able to use all their senses more effectively. They have more connections between those areas. And what does it look like in a CVI? Less, right? So it almost appears that ocular blind, you have a hyper-connected brain, and CVI, you have an under-connected brain. Should this surprise you that the strategies that we use for ocular blindness seem to not work for CVI? vice versa. Their brains are wired completely differently. Right? So this is, again, just putting numbers to this in the interest of time, I won't go through this, just to give you a sense that we can actually quantify the structural integrity of these pathways and try to correlate them with various deficits and dysfunction. Uh, in fact, there's one group in Belgium that's doing this. This is Al Zordis, and she did a very similar study along these lines, just looking at the temporal lobe, the potential stream. And she found that if you look at the structural integrity of that pathway, just that pathway, correlated with the object identification skill or dysfunction. So it seems to kind of go, again, if I could just get through and get them, is that all right? It seems to correlate. So the structure seems to support the underlying deficits. The next piece to this is looking at function. I talked about structure. Remember, the third piece now is function. And the way we look at this is a technique called visual retinopathy. You're all familiar with perimetry, right? This is perimetry onto the surface of the brain, right? Now, remember, as I told you, up is down. Down is up, right is left, left is right. We can use visual stimuli and track the activation spatially on the visual cortex surface. Right? So this is what we did in this particular case. So to keep it simply, we just looked at upper fuel activation versus lower fuel activation. In our sighted control here, notice that blue is the lower fuel, so it drives the top part of the visual brain. The upper visual field drives the lower part of the visual brain. Remember, as I told you, up is down, down. Look at our CVI patient. See this gap here, right, in her, in her upper, in the upper activation, which corresponds to her lower visual field? Where do you think her visual deficit is? Lower. Yeah, there's her, there's her half field. Sure enough, right? Deficit is now fitting with the function, right? So it's the third piece, structurally. Let's look at her optic radiations, right? Here's an intact optic radiation and a normal sided control. Here's the upper bank, the lower bank. Here it is in that same patient. She's essentially missing all the way up the bank. There's the structure, right? All kind of coming together, right? So going back to this idea that structure, this clinical presentation, this functional activation. In the interest of time, I'm going to just skip this aspect because we are looking specifically at motion deficits in these individuals as well. We use a tablet-based approach uh, to, uh, to analyze visual deficits in these children. And the reason why is because we want to go beyond just acuity and so on. Tablet base is quite nice because they can touch the screen and tell us what things are changing and so on. We can quantify it. And we also use something called Bayesian approaches, which allows us to use some sort of artificial intelligence where the software is guessing what is the next thing we can see. So now we can take a task and shrink that time very, very quickly. Right? If I know what the child sees, there's no point testing something bigger. I can spend my time testing small, and that's what the software is for. So we can decrease the time. One thing that's actually quite interesting, we can do something that's called a motion task here. And I apologize for the video. What we ask the child to think is, do you see these, these targets moving forward or backwards? And you just tell us, expanding versus contracting. You just tell us your screen. The hand that you're seeing is actually screen that you're seeing right there. And this is the task for me. And this is supposed to simulate optical flow moving through an environment. Right? Life is like that because it's deficit. The interesting thing we found with this is our CGI kids have really, really high thresholds. They take a lot of information before they can determine what what direction they're actually moving to. Again, fitting with these mobility issues that we've been reporting in these, in these past subjects. So what do we do now with this? Well, we have the behavior, we have the deficit, put them back into the scanner, right? We know the structure now because we know the connections between the visual cortex and MT. MT is the area of the brain responsible for motion specific. And we also can drive the brain from a functional standpoint as well. So again, we can turn the cycle around. 
We have the visual perceptual deficit, we have the brain structure, we have the brain activation, and we train the system to put out more and more. Um, this is the name of the game. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to do a comprehensive clinical assessment for these individuals, everything from visual acuity to mobility, all sorts of deficits. Their structural brain wiring and looking at their functional activation. And the idea is to put all three together. And the idea is actually no one you can figure out the other two because right? they're all interconnected. That's, the, that's what we're trying to accomplish. I want to identify the people involved with this. As you might imagine, this is a big sort of tour de force approach to try and come up with this. On the clinical evaluation side, a number of individuals. On the top, you see Jenna Hagari. She's a neuropediatric ophthalmologist in children's. She uh, does a lot of preliminary, excuse me, preliminary evaluations uh, for these individuals. Below, you see Peter Vex. As a psychophysicist, he develops a lot of the visual path that we use using tablets and, uh, and Bayesian-based approaches. And of course, the three musketeers that you see below there, that's Dr. Barry Cran, Barry Craig, and Dr. Louisa Meyer here from Perkins, who are instrumental in telling us the real-world situation. Many, many times, I always have these crazy ideas, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to do this, and they're like, okay, but that's just not the real world. And their insight is invaluable to this project, because they really tell us what the real world is, and what are the real questions on the structural imaging side, it's being led by Dr. Karina Bauer, who's sitting right there, she's a postdoctoral fellow uh, in the lab. She is responsible for all the pretty vain pictures that you've been seeing all morning. And on the functional neuroimaging side, this is Dr. David Summers um, from Boston University, he actually did one of my postdoctoral fellows with this gentleman. Everything I know about brain imaging, I learned from this guy. So it's been an absolute privilege, uh, privilege excuse me, and an honor to work uh, with this team. As, as you might imagine, to do something of this scope and this magnitude takes a lot of individuals, a lot of expertise. Um, so my conclusion in terms of CVI, in the setting of CVI, there appears to be extensive reorganization throughout the brain. However, how this rewiring relates to visual development, compensatory strategies, and the recovery of function remains largely unknown. We need to keep going in this. We have a sense that things are different. Things are different. We, uh, change is going on, but we need more individuals, more scanning, and more, more data to confirm this. Um, again, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this. Here are some questions I kind of want to leave with you that have been kind of bothering me, if you will. So one, how does visual dysfunction relate to underlying brain structure and function? So that was the first question that we were trying to tackle here at this presentation, right? We need more experiments and more, more data to figure this out. Why do some individuals with CVI improve and others don't? This is a big, big question I'm sure you're all concerned about, right? Why do some kids do well and some don't? Is it all related to their connectivity? Is there any way that looking inside their brain tells us gives us a sense of what kids are going to do well and which kids are not. What exactly is the impact of educational training programs on the brain and overall development of function? We like to think that when we intervene and a child does well, it's because of us. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I hate to break it to you, it's not always the case. Maybe that kid did better for reasons completely unrelated to what you did. And I think we need to have used our brain, brain imaging to give us a sense of what's working and what isn't and why the change is actually uh, generalizations along the CVI spectrum, right? Derek mentioned this idea that CVI is a large, large spectrum. We work particularly with one group of individuals or a cohort of individuals for logistical reasons. And the information that we get, we don't know if that's going to apply across the spectrum. So that's another thing we need to, to think about. So what this tells us is the need for longitudinal studies and evidence-based approaches. You can imagine scanning a kid very, very young and following them five years later and comparing pre and post, right? An individual who got services versus a kid who didn't get services did well versus the kid didn't do well, and now all of a sudden you start teasing apart these factors. Okay? That's sort of the idea behind this. Some final thoughts. Um, what are the criteria that determine the services and benefits for an individual with CVI beyond visual acuity and visual flow? I promise I wrote this last week. I didn't write this yesterday. This is something I think about as well, and it's, uh, you know, I think is the, the thousand pound gorilla in the room that we need to, we need to, to, to address. And do strategies for individuals with ocular blindness apply to individuals with CVI and vice versa? And it's a fundamental question we need to think about, right? If their brains are different, does that mean that the strategy should also be different? There might be some overlap, there might be things that are unique to this population as well, and we have to figure that out. If we build it, will they come? There was a time when Kevin Costner was a really, really good actor. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a movie, there was a movie called Field of Dreams, right? And it's about this farmer in Kansas, I believe, and he's hearing this voice, you know, build it and they will come, build it and they will come. And finally he ends up mowing down half his cornfield and building this baseball uh, uh, diamond, and finally his dad shows up and they start talking. Uh, I really hope that this project is not a field of dreams. I really hope that if we build it, they will come, and we have a reason to understand why this information is helpful. It would be horrible in my mind to do all this effort, all this brain imaging, and not influence the way we take care of this patient. This is why this collaboration is important. You need to be able to tell us what are the questions that are important to you, what are the answers that would make a difference, Um, there is, I think, an immediate impact to this type of imaging. I'll tell you a quick story. 
Um, very fortunate, Korea published uh, the first results of this study, this brain imaging study in this journal. So the Journal of the American Association of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Business. As luck would have it, we just happened to make the cover of this journal. For whatever reason, they like, they like the pretty pictures and they decided to put it on the cover. And just for fun, we thought it would be good to just give them a copy and send it to the kids and the families who participated in this study. And this one particular uh, individual who became very, very close to the CDI one, we sent it to the family. They took the journal, the mom and the girl took the journal, they marched to their school, into the principal's office, and they said, you see, I told you there was something wrong with my brain. <laughs> I told you. Now, I'd love to be able to tell you that the principal backed off and said, okay, we'll give you everything you want. Well, sure, that's not what happened, but it's forcing the dialogue. They can't be ignored anymore. Sooner or later, there's going to be enough pressure from enough directions that change is going to come, and we want to be part of that change. That's our goal. We have a dog in, in this hunt as well. And this is why we're, we're on board with you. I think enough pressure from enough, from enough direction will make a difference for these individuals. And we think that this is a contribution we can make. Keep in mind also that the NIH is spending a lot of money trying to figure out brain connectivity. President Obama has pledged a lot of money in this area. And again, so much money in autism, so much money in Alzheimer's, different areas. Why not CDI? Right? Why not? And then the last thing I'll mention, just a, a shameless plug, uh, we mentioned yesterday the importance of social interactions and community. We have a Facebook page. Very, very important. We're the CVI Neuroplasticity Research Group. It's great. We reach out to various families, parents, kids, past participants, our friends of ours as well. They post their experience. Oh, I had fun. This was great. We post articles that we think are interesting. Great, great community building. Great sense to, to work with individuals. And it's probably, in my mind, by far the most rewarding experience about this project. Working with these families, getting to know these individuals has been absolutely incredible. And again, it's just the beginning, and I hope it, uh, it continues. The shameless plug for our project, I'm showing you here in the lower right, this is uh, our pamphlet for our study. I have some copies of the front desk uh, as well. If you think you have an individual who might be uh, worthwhile you know, for us to work with, who might be interested, please reach out to us. Myself, Karina sitting here as well, and of course the team from Perkins. We'd love the chance to work with you. We'd love the chance to get to know a little bit more about your kids, what they're having struggles with, and if we can give you some more information behind that. So please, please reach out. So again, thank you to many, many people involved in this project. I mentioned from the lab, I mentioned also the collaborators. I want to highlight also again our collaboration here with Perkins, Boston University, the National Eye Institute, the Massachusetts Lions Fund, and as well as the Deborah Monroe Memorial Fund. We've been very, very fortunate to get support from various foundations. Um, it's been a great, great start. It's been a tough, uh, getting it off the ground, a lot of logistics to work through, but I think we're well on our way, and uh, like I said, hopefully uh, this will be a field of dreams. I thank you all for your time. I apologize, I probably went way, way over, but I wanted to... Really, uh, of the wiring. You cannot determine the, the directionality 
of information travel. There are ways to do that using what's called causal models for functional connectivity. It's another thing that we've been looking at. But determining the direction of travel and what is influencing what is a big mathematics-driven way to do it. We are experimenting with that, if you will, but it's still something that's very, very kind of black boxy and so on. And that's why we went with this white matter issue, is because they're there and we get a sense what this speaks to is that there's lots of ways you can slice this. And it's, 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 it's the, the totality of evidence that's going to matter. You have to be able to use a multimodal approach, and it all kind of has to make sense. Here. Well, and are, are we also looking in terms of, from a diagnostic standpoint, to, to for the imaging to also be supported by and vice versa with other behavioral indicators? Yes. So it's not just imaging alone. Correct. It's also all those indi other indicators Correct. and strategies. Absolutely. It's, it's a sort of, as I said, a tour de force approach to putting it all together, and it all kind of has to make sense. I think that's what makes this project a little bit unique, is we're putting all the pieces together. Some people have just looked at the structure. Some people have just looked at the function. And of course, a lot of people have just looked at the visual dysfunction. Can you put it all together in a way that actually makes sense? One of the biggest challenges, I can tell you, is the tremendous variability that some of you guys might imagine, right? That's part of the reason why we stayed with this age category, and in particular, those individuals with PDL. We try to get some sort of homogeneity, if you will, with the study population to start. And as we get bigger and bigger data sets, we can get a little bit wider as well. Okay. Could you yeah. show the pair questionnaire uh, that you use? Yeah, absolutely. The questionnaire in terms of? Like it's gathering information. Sure. So you're gathering functional information. Right. Assuming from a questionnaire. Right, or right. An observation. Yeah, so that, that's really where the purpose team actually kind of comes yeah. in. And it's something that we're discussing right now is what does that questionnaire look like for us? We've discussed Sutton versus the Roman, all sorts of things. Derek, I think you can. Derek, I think you, you can you can speak uh, more well, members, but if you want, go ahead. Um, well, I think there's three primary ones that, that we certainly Christine's piece, um, which looks at kind of the lower functioning. Yeah. Uh, then we've got Dutton, but then we're also using the Ortigos. Correct. And the Ortigos is kind of emerging as a, as a little bit more expedient. Yeah. So a couple of caveats here. One, so you know, you might argue, well, lying in a scanner isn't really real world. You can only image what the person can actually do in the scanner. And that's that's an important piece. The other thing to realize is that this is not real time imaging. People think that this is activation while the gene is passed. It's not. It's post processing. We look at the data. We can prep this and do that. One arena that we started looking, or we're starting to develop, is EEG, electroencephalography, which you're all familiar with. And we have developed now with a company in Spain a wireless system. They wear a cap, they're directly recording brain activity, and they're feet away from us. They can walk around and do whatever they want, and we're collecting the data like they're in trees. Right? That's another way to do that. There are pros and cons. You never have the spatial resolution in an EEG that you need in an fMRI. But you have the temporal resolution, and the fact that you're recording direct brain activity. So the moral of the story is, is that there is no one technique that can give you all the answers. You have to use a multimodal approach, converging, leveraging That's what wasn't done in the past. I think that's what makes this study, I believe, more powerful. We were converging in various strategies. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, oh, well, there's a question, question to the med med, and then we're, yeah. of course, going to have. Oh, yeah, yeah. and yeah. the animator. Yeah. 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 What is the yeah. 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 was what are individuals in the field of neuro-ophthalmology, and the example we gave is Dr. Joseph Rizzo, um, who is actually a mentor of mine at Mass Eye, and you're doing in terms of the arena of CBI. Uh, Joe, as I said, is a, is a personal friend and somebody who, uh, who, uh, who I've learned a lot from, and like me, had no idea what CBI was when I, when I spoke to him about it. He's a brilliant man. This is an individual who's ignoring information. 
It just kind of tells you that over time, especially in the clinical world, you tend to get used to the people you see and get really good at that and you stop looking around. And that's kind of sort of typical. The neuro-ophthalmologists typically that we've worked with and communicated with particularly work with pediatric populations because they're the ones seeing them. Right? They're coming in. This is a fixable with glasses. I do the strabismus surgery. You still see that. Right? What's with this funny MRI? And then they start thinking about it a little bit more. So you only can be thinking about this unless you see them. And I would be seeing them. So that's just unfortunately how, how it works. But the nice thing about it, Joe has been a great, great mentor with this and using his overall expertise as a, as a neuro ophthalmologist about you know, imaging techniques and strategies and so on, but applying those strategies to the specific population. And that's, and that's how the, the wheel turns. Uh, this, I, I know you had one early on, so I will leave that. Go ahead. Well, I have two questions. I'm okay. going back to Paul's question now yeah. in regards to outreach to yeah. the folks that don't even get to the pediatric neurological yeah. if yeah. the OBs are out there and right. they say, that, you know, ocular health is fine. Sure. We can't help you. Is there a lot of outreach within your field going to those folks and saying, okay, when you see that, that's what they're complaining about, then there is another level. Right. And we find that with low vision in general, but right. this is even at a higher oh, level absolutely. in regards to there's something wrong functionally, we know it's a problem, but right. there's nothing I can do about it, so there's nothing that can be done. A absolutely. And so again, great question, and that is the reality. Um, from my experience, I, I don't teach at the Optometry College, so I don't know exactly what the curriculum is and so on, but unfortunately that's kind of the reality of things in medicine. Things have to really be a big problem before they end up you know, as part of the curriculum. And the other sad thing I have to say, I, I don't mean to be pessimistic, is that it's economics, right? What drives these things? Economics, money, right? right? These are big, big things, you know? If, if there's value to be seeing these patients, et cetera, and all of a sudden people are doing it, right? So Dr. Pan, I think you, you may have some, some comments from the, from the colleagues on your Certainly one of the kids when I was in school. Oh. Yeah. So it is happening. Yeah. It just takes time for it to kind of percolate into the practice. Uh, question from uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was just looking at the statistics and seeing that yeah. we're already seeing now, not really, but mental health all over the population at home. Yeah. seen the thing that is crucial is meetings like this. I mean, this is the first one of its kind that I know of, right? I mean, this is an important point. And I, and I, just, I just think that this is the time to do it. You talked about the five questions, right? We know what this is. We know how to do it. If it's not when, or if it's not now, when. If it's not us, who? And if it's not here, where are we going to do it? This is an ideal place to do it. We have the resources, we have the tools, we have the expertise, academically, clinically, from an education standpoint. Wouldn't it be incredible if the way we take care of CVI kids in this country was essentially modeled 